Hi again, everybody. Welcome to Inside Golf. I'm Harry Donahue. This year is the centennial year for the Philadelphia section of the PGA. And recently, the section held a centennial pro-am at beautiful Saucon Valley Country Club in Bethlehem. Who better than Pete Trenum to recall some of the highlights of the section over the past 100 years? Included will be a short remembrance by Dal Finsterwald, an interview we did with Dal seven years ago at Lanark, where in 1958 he won the PGA Championship. Also, our partners at Valley Forge Tourism, and we'll check in to see what they've been up to this fall. And of course, we'll have our teed off panel. Stay with us. It's all coming up next on Inside Golf. The 24th season of Inside Golf is presented by Destination Monco Golf. 50 courses, over 300,000 yards. Check them out at MontcoGolf.com. By the first tee, Greater Philadelphia. Building game changers. The first tee not only helps young men and women become better golfers, but most important, better people. Get involved. Visit firstteephiladelphia.org. By the Philadelphia Association of Golf Course Superintendents, a community of professionals enhancing the game of golf since 1925. Make sure you thank your golf course superintendent today. By GAP, celebrating amateur golf since 1897. By Jersey Man and Philly Man Magazine, a digital publication and private business network. Read the current issue free at jerseymanmagazine.com. And by Inside Golf's partner since 1998, the Philadelphia PGA section, the experts in the game and business of golf, and celebrating their centennial year. Take time to thank your local men and women PGA professionals. Golf is the great equalizer. For many, this journey is an escape from reality, a chance to be part of a team, a career opportunity, PGA Reach impacts lives through golf by lifting people up, giving them hope, and sending them down an alternate path that they never saw coming. With PGA Reach Philadelphia, as in life and in golf, the most important shot you take is the next one. A group consisting of 96 PGA professionals and amateurs recently played in the Philadelphia Section Centennial Pro-Am at Saucon Valley Country Club. The event capped a year of looking back on the section's history. Founded in 1921, the Philadelphia Section now manages nearly 900 PGA members, employed at over 590 golf facilities in eastern Pennsylvania, southern New Jersey, Delaware, and northeastern Maryland. Pro-Am participants were treated to historical tidbits at the tee boxes, featuring some of the section's highlights. And local golf historian Pete Trenum, himself a member of the Philadelphia section, talked about the influence of several individuals from the section who served as past PGA of America presidents. We've had five presidents uh, that worked in the Philadelphia PGA. And uh, the uh, first one was Ed Dudley who was pro at Concord and Philadelphia Country Club. And while he was pro at Philadelphia Country Club, he was all pro, pro at the Augusta National Golf Club during the uh, early years of the Masters. He was the first pro at Augusta National. And he also played on three Ryder Cup teams, so he, he did it all, really. And then there was Leo Frazier, who owned Atlantic City Country Club and was the head pro there at the same time. And he was a national president, and uh, during his time, the uh, PGA of America and the golf pl professional players had a little divorce, and uh, they were going to really have uh, a tough time because each one was planning a, a schedule for that next year and with a qualifying school and everything else, and when Leo got elected, he thought this is not a good thing for golf, and so he made peace with the players and they created a players uh, division and of the PGA and uh, went on and both have done very well uh, separately and working to make golf better. And then there was Henry Poe who was the pro at Reading Country Club and uh, he was a pro for two years and, uh, and after that 
came Dick Smith, who was one of the great players in the Philadelphia section and uh, won five Philadelphia section championships and uh, was, became president of the PGA. And after, after him came Jack Conley, who was the pro at uh, Huntington Valley Country Club. And while he was the president of the PGA of America, uh, 911 happened and a lot of things had to be changed, like the uh, Ryder Cup had to be postponed for a year and uh, many other things. So it was a turbulent time, but uh, he did a great job of handling all that. So we've been, we've been blessed for some great leaders in Philadelphia. In addition to those great leaders, the local section has played host to a number of PGA championships and majors. And Pete remembers several of those notable events and some of the participants. Philadelphia section hosted the PGA of America championship at, at Shawnee in 1938. And that was uh, always a memorable one because Paul Runyon, who was outdriven by 40 or 50 yards every hole by Sam Snead, defeated Sam Snead in the 36 hole finals by a, about a score of like eight and seven. And uh, then two years later, the uh, PGA Championship was at Hershey. It's hosted by Milton Hershey at his Hershey Country Club. And uh, in a period of uh, five years, we hosted three PGA Championships. And at Hershey, Byron Nelson, who had been the pro at Reading just the year before, beat Sam Snead in the finals. Then two years later, it was Sam Snead's turn. They played at uh, Seaview, and Sam Snead beat Jim Ternisa in the finals. And uh, Jim Ternisa played the full, whole tournament in his Army uniform because he was stationed up at Fort Dix. And uh, the only way he could play in the tournament, he had to donate everything that he won to uh, the Army charities. And so he was allowed time off to come play in the tournament, and the Army made out well. And, uh, and two days later, Sam Snead was in the Navy. And that was 1942. And then, 1958, the PGA Championship came to Lanark Country Club. And Marty Lyons was the pro at Lanark Country Club, and he had gone to the PGA of America, and he'd campaigned to have a championship at Lanark. And uh, there'd been some tour tournaments at Lanark. Actually, uh, Byron Nelson won one of his 11 straight tournaments at, at Lanark. So, uh, and it turned out uh, through the promotion and ideas of Marty Lyons, it was the first PGA championship played at stroke play. Uh, Marty thought that he, he visited the tournament the year before and saw a great tournament that lost money because uh, television wasn't interested because the best players weren't necessarily going to be there on the weekend. And so uh, he wrote a letter to the PGA of America and uh, they changed the term tournament from match play to stroke play and uh, CBS televised it and uh, two and a half hours of, on Sunday, the, the uh, last few holes of the finals. And Dow Finsterwald uh, won the final, won the uh, championship. And uh, the first one played at stroke play, and uh, Billy Casper finished second. Seven years ago, we at Inside Golf were fortunate to speak with Dal Finsterwald at Lanark Country Club about that victory. Well, Dal, nobody played this course as well as you did back in 1958. Just to go back there, uh, you weren't in the lead into the final round, but uh, you were at the end the champion, and you were only one of two players in the entire field the shoot under par. Par was 70, and I think you finished three under, and Billy Casper finished one under, and Sam Snead, who had the lead going into the final round, had some problems on that final 18 and finished at 73. And I had hit a very poor shot to the green and was stymied by a tree, and uh, some way I got it over the tree, and I made about a 12-foot putt on not the smoothest surface, and so that made that was more luck than skill. Four years later, the uh, championship came to Aronimek. Gary Player became the winner. He was the winner, and he was the first golf professional, first per person to win the PGA Championship who was not domiciled in the United States, which was uh, a first for sure. 
And the PGA Championship will again be returning to Aronimic in 2026. The local PGA section is known for giving back to the community. And that is something that dates back to World War II. In 1943, Marty Lyons was the president of the Philadelphia PGA and uh, the United States was in the middle of World War II. At the spring meeting, Marty Lyons gave Leo Deagle full authority to, to use it. Deagle was the uh, Philadelphia section tournament chairman. He gave him full authority to use the tournament schedule any way he could to raise money for wartime charities. So Leo Deagle came up with an idea that there would uh, be an exhibition played between the, the professionals from the Philadelphia section, the amateurs from the Golf Association of Philadelphia, and the women from the Women's Golf Association of Philadelphia. So Woody Platt captained one team, and Glenn Ver, who won the U.S. Women's Amateur five times, she captained one team, and Leo Deagle captained one team. And each one of them picked 11 players. And so they played in threes with a, a pro and a man, man amateur and a woman amateur in each group. And uh, so the club that hosted the tournament had to pay $500 to host the tournament. And all proceeds went to uh, the, the, they were, what the idea was they were gonna buy an ambulance for the Red Cross, that's what they set out to do. So uh, they played that day and they had a great turnout and you either had to pay a dollar to come to the tournament or you could bring a, a steel shafted golf club for the scrap iron uh, drive. And when the tournament was over, or the day was over, People from the Red Cross said, instead of buying an ambulance, why don't you go out to Valley Forge General Hospital and see what you could do there. So Leo Deagle and Marty Lyons went out there and they decided to build a golf course for the wounded veterans. So they built a nine hole golf course, and, uh, not too long, you know, holes are like 90 yards to about uh, 225 and uh, for, the, for the veterans and uh, and they set up in the gymnasium, so uh, they started giving, giving lessons before the, while the course was being built. And uh, every pro in the Philadelphia section either donated time or money or, or equipment to this effort. And they played more exhibitions and uh, raised more money and uh, they got the course built. And it was, a, it was a great thing. And before they were done, they built a course at Fort Dix and they had three putting courses at three uh, of the uh, veterans' hospitals. And it was uh, before, and before it was over, because of what Philadelphia started, every PGA section in the United States had some kind of a rehab facility for uh, it, with golf for the wounded veterans. It was really a, probably the, the greatest thing the Philadelphia PGA has ever done. A big thanks goes out to Saucon Valley Country Club their professional staff and their membership for hosting such a wonderful event for us. Uh, it really gave us the opportunity uh, to finish the year on a high note, celebrating all the unique accomplishments that our section and our professionals have had over the last 100 years. Uh, we also want to thank our partners at Montco Golf and Valley Forge Tourism, and of course our partners at Inside Golf for helping document our 100th year. We certainly look forward to the next 100 years. Uh, we hope everybody has a great winter and hope to see you back on the golf course soon. Thank you. Welcome back to Inside Golf. Recently, our partners at Valley Forge Tourism once again helped to sponsor the annual Rev Run. It was done virtually and it raised $42,000 for Valley Forge National Park. Rachel Riley joins us now and Rachel's joined by the race director. 
We're here at Valley Forge National Historical Park with Kirsten Tallman. She is the race director for Valley Forge Revolutionary Five Mile Run with a pretty big announcement, right, Kirsten? Yes. What happened with this year's virtual race? So this year we went virtual for Rev Run 2021, um, and we were able to raise forty-two thousand um, dollars on a year where we weren't sure what was going on. Um, so uh, we've got a big announcement that we raised forty-two thousand dollars, which also puts us at the benchmark of a half a million dollars in the um, lifespan of this race in the park. So that was year 15 for us um, and took us right over the half a million dollar mark. So we were pretty stoked about that. Yeah, pretty big milestone, pretty big year and all in a year when everything was virtual. So, I mean, what does that mean to you and to the park? It says a lot about how people feel about Valley Forge National Historical Park and, and what this place means to them. Um, I know for me, when I was running here, like I always wanted to give back and do something. And my gosh, here we are 15 years later and look with that. I kind of took it to the next level. Um, but for other people that um, came out and found an oasis and a place to recover and, and, and to use a space to um, rejuvenate, um, they found heart in this place and that's how they gave back. So not only that, you know, we, we had the uh, people that come in and use the park, but because we went virtual, we were able to touch people in four countries and in 25 states. When we think about that, that's half of the United States that participated in Valley Forge National Historical Park's revolutionary five mile run. That's pretty good. Yeah, it just shows you how passionate people are about this park. Talk a little bit about where some of those funds have gone, will go. Sure, sure. So um, when we have the funds come in from the, the sponsors and the stakeholders and the runners and walkers, the funds go back into the visitor experience in Valley Forge National Park. So that means the um, wayfinding um, kiosks are available so they can tell where to go, what trails to use. We've done some trail um, connectors in our years. Um, uh, coming up will be water bottle filling stations, which is a great thing that doesn't exist too much in this park, but we're going to be doing that. Um, and then there's some interpretive wayside panels, so, you know, so that education piece also comes through. So that the idea is when people come into the park, they can see and experience a whole new thing. Um, and that's what we are happy to do. And speaking of experiencing, seeing new things next year, we, <laughs> you've announced the date for next year's race. And what else about next year's race? So next year, uh, well, this well next year is um, April 24th and we're going to do a hybrid event, which means um, we had so much success with the virtual race that we're going to keep that virtual piece in there and then also do the in-person race, which people are dying to come back into the park and run with, you know, shoulder to shoulder with their buddies. Um, so we will be doing a hybrid event for um, a week long, which will be um, the uh, National Park Week. So it starts uh, no, uh, April 16th and runs to the 24th. And then on the 24th, we will have that in-person race here in the park. Exciting. Looking forward to that next year. Thanks, Kirsten, and congratulations again on that success. For the Valley Forge Tourism and Convention Board, I'm Rachel Riley. Some very nice contributions, and if you were one of the contributors by participating, thank you, and hope to see you next year in the annual Rev Run. Also, the Valley Forge Tourism and Convention Bureau's Freedom from Hunger Drive has surpassed its food goal of 25,000 pounds and now has a record of over 30,000 pounds. Individuals and businesses donated to this fundraiser, which has now exceeded 75,000 pounds of food to feed the hungry in Monco. The VFTCB is also partnered with the Monco Anti-Hunger Network that works to keep families stable with food assistance, providing food to pantries in the county. The food program has benefited over 84,000 people and increased the number of food pantries in the area from 38 to 47. Because of the continual need to keep families stable with food assistance, this Freedom From Hunger Drive will continue throughout the month of December. To donate, just visit valleyforge.org slash hunger. Stay with us. Next to come, our teed off time. Uh, I was not at all surprised. Welcome back Inside Golf continues with our teed off panel. We're back here at Lulu Country Club. And speaking of Lulu, if you'd like more information about memberships and how you could become part of the Lulu experience, go to their website, lulucc.com. Joe Logan is here with us again. Joe from myphillygolf.com. How long has myphillygolf.com been around? 2009. 2009, 12, 13 years, huh? Good job. Thanks. Okay. Jim Smith, he is the director of golf at the Philadelphia Cricket Club. 
And Jim, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me back. And Marty Emino joins us today. I haven't seen Marty in a while. He's been part of our history here on Teed Off at Inside Golf. Marty, Director of Communications for GAP, the Golf Association of Philadelphia, hence the logo. Yeah, good to see you again, Harry. How's it going? You're looking good. Okay, I'll start with you, Marty, on okay. this topic of uh, a change of career again for Bones Mackay. Uh, Bones, of course, longtime caddy, especially for Phil Mickelson. Uh, had his ups and downs with Phil, and then, what, two, three, three years ago, I guess, decided to go to TV. And, you know, I thought it was a perfect transition. I thought he did a great job, and now, He's going back to caddying, this time for Justin Thomas. First of all, were you surprised by the move? I was. I actually remember seeing the tweet thinking, uh, you know, what's going on here? But, uh, you know, probably loves the game more than we know. He did a great job on television. Um, and maybe there's a part of him that wants to say, hey, what can I do without Phil Mickelson? I know we were, we were tight, but, you know, what can I do with another guy who can play? Had a taste of Justin Thomas for a little bit, had a little success. So maybe he's just uh, trying to improve his resume, per se. Right, yeah, he was a sub when Justin Thomas's caddy was uh, off the bag for a couple of events, and he did pretty well with that, obviously. Uh, but getting back to my initial question to uh, Marty, Jim, I'm surprised that after three years and growing in that profession that he decides to go back to his other profession. I probably was less surprised. Um, I, I think maybe it was a case of when he was a caddy for as many years as he was, you know, sometimes you get a little stale and sometimes you think the grass is greener and you might want to go try something else and you go try it and whether you're good at it or not, and he was, I thought, very good at it, uh, oftentimes you return to your roots and I, maybe he just kind of had a, a, a sort of self-awareness about himself that said, yeah, I, I, I'm good at this, but like my real love is caddying and that's okay. I mean, it's, it's fine to try other things and if you find that that's not something that you love as much as what you're doing before, go back to doing what you love more. Yeah, and I'm sure, Joe, the fact that it was now Justin Thomas that he's going to caddy for, uh, you know, it's not right. somebody of a lesser in terms of uh, talent and ability, golfer that he's working for. He's going right to the top of the glass. <laughs> uh, I was not at that all helps. surprised when I saw he was leaving because he, to me, he struck me as like every basketball or football coach who leaves the booth a little before they're done. I mean, leaves the field and goes to the booth for several years until somebody hires him back. I, I think that's exactly what happened to him. He thought he had unfinished business as a caddy. And when, when Justin Thomas calls, you're going to answer. And besides, going back for however long he caddies, whether it's a few months or five or 10 years, he's still a young guy, but it only enhances his value to TV. So whenever he decides to come back to TV, We'll come back with an even in an even stronger position. Yeah, this could be a relationship that goes on for 15 years, right? I mean, just in, in that age bracket, uh, as long as he doesn't have an injury or something like that to sidetrack him, he could be around for a while competitively. What was the secret, getting back to Bones on TV, uh, Jim, that made him credible and just enjoyable to listen to? You know, he didn't force anything. He just seemed like a natural out there. I mean, he, he you know he's, he's walked those fairways for... 20 or 25 years with the best players in the world. So who who are you going to trust more with their analysis and commentary than somebody who's been out there watching it? Not playing it, actually, but watching it, because that's what we're doing as viewers, is we're watching it, and he's sort of our voice. Um, so he, and he's, and he, he, he had a very, um, I felt like a, a very, uh, almost like a Romo-ish way to make what might seem complicated very simple, because he knew the terms and he knows the game really well, and he just made it easy, he was easy to listen to. Yeah, and I'm sure he got a lot of inside dope, not just from players, oh. but from their caddies. Well, he, I mean, heck, he knew how caddies were thinking. He knew what players were thinking. He's been there, he, and, and he could, like Jim said, express all that in relatively layman's terms, and he did it in a very unobtrusive way. I, I know when I'd watch broadcasts with him, only sometimes I would be going, who is that talking? And it, and it was Bones. He doesn't have a terribly distinctive voice that stands out like, you know, some of the others, Faraday, uh, and I'd have to think for a minute. And then I'd realize that's Bones and he knows what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah, and he was a go-to guy the networks realized early on, I think. So when he was out there, he was covering the key players that were performing, you know, and that, that's going to be missed. That's not as easy as a lot of people think. Gentlemen, thank you. We'll be back. More of Inside Golf in a moment.
Designed by Donald Ross, Lulu Country Club is one of the premier private golf courses in Montgomery County. This classic 18-hole course boasts a new state-of-the-art clubhouse with many amenities for members to enjoy. Members are invited to play in events, tournaments, and enjoy guest privileges. For more information, contact membership at lulucc.com. The road home for the holidays, where the ultimate driving machine becomes the ultimate cruise through three states machine. The ultimate zip around the corner for mom's cooking machine. And even the ultimate we couldn't get out of there any faster machine. Because at BMW, we know every holiday looks different. So we created the ultimate whatever your road home looks like machine. Hurry in to receive a credit of up to $2,500 through January 3rd. Well, that's going to do it for this week's edition of Inside Golf. Next week, we'll be here at Lanark Country Club in Havertown. The reason? We're going to profile Marty Lyons. Marty started here as a caddy back in the early 1900s. Eventually, he became the club's head professional. But there was a lot more to the Marty Lyons story because in 1958, he convinced the PGA of America to hold its annual PGA Championship right here at Lanark, Marty Lyons, recently inducted into the PGA National Hall of Fame, and we'll profile his life here at Lanark and beyond next week. I'm Harry Donahue. Remember, no matter how bad it's going for you out there, don't pick up. We'll see you next week from Lanark here on Inside Golf. The 24th season of Inside Golf is presented by Destination Montco Golf. 50 courses, over 300,000 yards. Check them out at montcogolf.com. Buy the first tee, Greater Philadelphia. Building game changers. The first tee not only helps young men and women become better golfers, but most important, better people. Get involved. Visit firstteephiladelphia.org. Buy the Philadelphia Association of Golf Course Superintendents, a community of professionals enhancing the game of golf since 1925. Make sure you thank your golf course superintendent today. By GAP, celebrating amateur golf since 1897. By Jersey Man and Philly Man Magazine, a digital publication and private business network. Read the current issue free at jerseymanmagazine.com. And by Inside Golf's partner since 1998, the Philadelphia PGA section, the experts in the game and business of golf, and celebrating their centennial year. Take time to thank your local men and women PGA professionals.